Hi, Susie. Welcome to the Genetic Genius Podcast. I'm so excited to have you as a guest today. Welcome. Hi, Dr. Lulu. Thanks you so much for having me. You're welcome. Before we dive deep into the show today, I'd love for you to talk about who you are for our listeners, what you do, what's your like primary passion that you do on the planet. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm a licensed doctor of physical therapy. I'm also a sexual health counselor and educator, and I've been practicing physical therapy and sexual health, particularly for men's pelvic health and sexual health issues for the past decade. And I am super passionate about this very special group of people. <laughs> people with penises. <laughs> <Right>. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know that today is going to be a wonderful experience about learning who you are, what you do, and also about, uh, about having fun. Cause that's one thing I really like about you is, is your honesty and helping people feel comfortable, which I know we're going to have fun with today. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited. <laughs> Okay, so let's break down some things for the listeners today. So you talked about what you do a little bit, but let's talk about like what's pelvic pain anyway. And I guess mainly mainly from the men's per, or male perspective, I guess would be the best way for a guide. But if you want to talk about both the women's and the male perspective, that would be fine too. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Lulu. <laughs> so what is male pelvic pain? In the literature, you'll read or hear about it named as chronic prostatitis or chronic pelvic pain syndrome. I like to preface that prostatitis with air quotes um, <laughs> is an umbrella term that is from the traditional medical sense uh, is the diagnosis that many of uh, these men who experience pelvic pain will have. It is not necessarily completely an honest diagnosis in that sense because 95 to 95 95 to 97 percent of cases are not related to any infection of the prostate. So mm -hmm. less than 5% actually has to do with any type of prostatic infection. And so uh, the National Institute of Health then designated a certain uh, several or four categories for um, prostatitis and included one being non-bacterial chronic prostatitis, otherwise known as chronic pelvic pain syndrome. What does that entail, <laughs> right? So what does right. that all mean, right? Exactly. So, so when uh, when someone experiences pain, pelvic pain, and I'm speaking from the uh, male perspective or anyone that has a penis, it can include anything from uh, pain in the penis, uh, pain in the, around the anus, testicular pain, groin pain, abdominal pain. Um, it could also mean pain with sexual function. So sexual pain specifically like with an erection or with ejaculation. And there can also be accompanying symptoms of lower urinary tract symptoms that may be urinary urgency or frequency, mm -hmm. painful urination, um, et cetera. So that, that is most typically that umbrella, um, uh, comp that umbrella uh, symptoms or signs and symptoms that I would see in the clinic. Right. Yeah. Well, that's great. So that kind of gives us this bigger picture of what like pelvic pain involves because it is, um, I like almost like a mysterious thing <laughs> because I, you know, I, I think one thing I like about what you do is that you bring it out into the open so people can talk about it. But I think it's almost like this little box, like, oh, I don't want to say that I have pelvic pain or, you know, uh, how do I yeah. find out about what to do or even, uh, you know, where to start. <laughs> so I think that's a great right. thing about what you do is like helping people to understand the aspects of it. So you were talking about, there's a couple different or many different aspects that can be involved with pelvic pain. And so what, how did you get started in this field? Like, was there, was there, you know, like a light bulb went off you're like, this is what I want to do. <laughs> That is also a wonderful question that I guess asked a lot, like, how did you get into this field to begin with? Mm -hmm. And I wish I had a more exciting story, but I really <laughs> don't. It was actually the grace of my patients that reached out to me asking me for help. So my career started in, uh, you know, working just with women and, and then just based on the information on my website several years ago, men would just reach out to me and say, Hey, I have very similar symptoms. Do you think you can help me? Mm -hmm. And it was through that, that experience and working with these men that I started to 
realize that there is a much needed um, advocacy and also education, just health literacy around um, male pelvic pain and accompanying sexual health um, concerns. And so that's when I took it upon myself to fill that um, need. Yeah, it's a, it's a super need. You know, I think, I don't remember what the exact statistics are, but it's a very different percentage of the amount of men that go and seek healthcare as opposed to women. And so, you know, I think that you are fulfilling a great need for the population that doesn't always even go and seek out help. <laughs> right, exactly. Because there's much stigma and embarrassment and shame around sexual health, pelvic mm -hmm. health concerns. And also medical providers just don't have sexual health education mm -hmm. to, or, or even, um, they don't ask the questions. <laughs> they right. don't ask the questions around <laughs> sexual health or anything like that. So, you know, it's really, and, and, people, men and women expect mm -hmm. their health provider to ask questions around sexual health and any concerns mm -hmm. that they may have. So yeah, it is definitely a taboo topic, but <laughs> the more education and the more comfort and the mm -hmm. more permission that we can all give each other to talk about it, the less, you know, the less suffering that may can result from, from some of these um, issues that men may experience. Yeah, that's so true. And, you know, I, I think about what you're saying too, is that it's hard for a health provider to in 15 minutes to find out in the visit, like the real root of what's going on with pelvic pain. Right. So, you know, and you have the opportunity to have more time and your expertise in helping dive deeper down into the root cause, which is my next question. <laughs> what are um, some of the like main uh, common root causes that you see in men that are suffering from pelvic pain? Yeah. So men who experience pelvic pain, it's, it's, there isn't really a single cause. And I know just from <laughs> your work, Dr. Lulu, you know, that there's, you <laughs> That's know, there's, right. <laughs> there's a lot of interdependent factors that um, can influence one's inner experience, particularly with pain. So we don't, to this day, don't have a single known cause for chronic pelvic pain syndrome in men. However, we do have several biologically plausible theories that are circulating in the literature. One of them being maybe perhaps the obvious or not so obvious is direct trauma to those tissues. So right. whether that's from an accident, a sexcapade, whatever, <laughs> you know, these tissues, just like any other tissues in your body are susceptible to injury mm -hmm. and how yeah. much is too much for any one penis it's going to depend on the person. Right. <laughs> so that could be, and that's why a sexual health intake is so important is to just mm -hmm. look at the details of the onset or the mm -hmm. mechanism of injury if there was one, because that's going to shape the treatment plan. Right. So direct injury, um, it can also be as a result of surgery. So let's say, mm -hmm. for example, there was a vasectomy surgery mm -hmm. that, that occurred, or perhaps there was a post prostate or a prostatectomy, a surgery where um, the person has to remove their prostate for, you know, whatever reason. Right. And most, most common is cancer. Right. Um, or you have a surgical procedure for an enlarged prostate that occurs, right? Mm -hmm. So there's several types of procedures that are out there for BPH, right? For the large prostate. Yep. So that could be a result of, or that can lead to uh, signs and symptoms of pelvic pain. Uh, going to the gut. So constipation. Mm -hmm. Right constipation, gut health related issues, microbiome, micronutrient deficiencies or nutrient deficiencies. Um, all of that can also interplay with a lot of the crosstalk or, or you know, visceral <laughs> sensitization that can right. occur because your, your rectum is right behind your bladder and your prostate. Right. And so any neighbor, <laughs> whether directly or indirectly related, can alert the alarm bells. Mm -hmm. And because your pelvic muscles, the muscles that are extend from your pubic bone all the way to your tailbone and basically um, are, are, are the compromise, the the bottom of you, if you were mm -hmm. a container, um, <laughs> act synergistically with your digestive system. And it's really right. an important part of, of detox, right? When you're pooping mm -hmm. and peeing, those are major detoxification processes. So, you know, you know, just looking at that as from that perspective, um, IBS has been mm -hmm. correlated, not causative, but correlated with pelvic dysfunction and vice versa. Mm -hmm. 
If anyone has, and that brings me to you know, chronic low back pain or low back pain in general, again, high correlation between low back issues and pelvic floor issues and vice versa, in addition to, I'm sure, digestive issues and, and such as constipation, just because of right. all of the overlapping structures in this area that receive information. Mm -hmm. It's um, all connected. <laughs> it is all connected. It is all connected. And then we go to autoimmune factors. So sometimes there might be an infection or mm -hmm. um, some sort of immune mediated response mm -hmm. in and around these structures like the prostate or the bladder or anywhere really that basically just ramps up the immune response, a protective mm -hmm. response. That makes um, sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, this could be an autoimmune related issue. It could just be an immune mediated issue. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of men will get, well, I didn't mention, but they're, they're, it's not an infection. However, they are treated with most oftentimes with several rounds of antibiotics, mm -hmm. very potent antibiotics, even though an infection is not present. And so that makes me think, and Dr. Lulu, you can chime in on this, is how does that disrupt the gut microbiome and, and the urogenital biome, right? right. So like- Destroys it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like you're adding gasoline to the fire, in my opinion, yeah. at that point. And it's really not comprehensive care. It's really a find it and fix it type of model, which mm -hmm. again, antibiotics play a role. And if there's truly an infection, which would be diagnosed with a prostatic fluid assessment, right. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. which is not being done. They're just doing a urine, urine analysis, which is and not yeah. comprehensive. No. And then, you know, again, you're finding yourself or the person is finding themselves basically in this circular feeling stuck in this, in this like cycle. So, you know, that, that in itself, I think ha is part of the like perpetuation or mm -hmm. the contributing factors to perhaps a resolution of symptoms lasting longer versus, um, really short term, short term. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. That's, that's amazing. So many different things can be tied to the pelvic floor, which as we know, our body, like we were saying, our bodies are totally connected from an organ perspective. Like you were saying, like a digestive perspective, all, everything always goes back to the gut. I tell my patients that all the time, <laughs> everything is tied to the gut. They're like, really my sleep. I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes. Tied to your gut yes. and with all of our sex organs, totally tied to the gut. And the microbiome yes. is so important as you were saying for constipation issues. And it's so true that there it's so close. That area is so close. Of course, it's going to be affecting the pelvic floor. Right. Exactly. hundred mm -hmm. percent. Um, some other on the same note of like, okay, what are some contributing factors? There's a, there's a, a notion out there, at least in the pelvic health world or, or <laughs> the PT world, right. Um, that, pelvic floor dysfunction, muscle tightness and tension is like one of the culprits. And I, I'm here to say that in my opinion, it is not one of the culprits. In fact, it is just a secondary, secondary protective response to mm -hmm. pain in a region mm -hmm. that is not, it is, is first of all, alarming to have, right? Because right. who, you know, it's not like your thumb where you can be like, oh my gosh, I, I banged <laughs> my thumb. Can you see it? Look how it's bruised. Oh, I know right. it's going to be okay. I've experienced this before. It's not a big deal. Whereas if it's in your private areas, I mean, mm -hmm. who do you talk to, especially if you're, if you're a male or right. identify as a male, you know, who do you, who do you talk to? Where do you go? I mean, this, this is a very private mm -hmm. part of our lives, a very intimate part of our body. Yeah. And so that in itself causes a great amount of distress mm -hmm. and stress, which Dr. Lulu, you know, <laughs> amplifies or turns up the dial on the sympathetic nervous system, mm -hmm. the immune mediated responses, sensitization in our body and all sorts of things. So, you know, pelvic muscle tightness and tension. I mean, how can mm -hmm. you even objectify what's tight versus relax? Like there's no objective measurement. This right. is only, this is a feeling and just like any type of muscular bracing or guarding in the body in response to a threat in one's world or existence is going to be, um, is going to manifest. And so right. I tell my patients, like <laughs> you may have heard, you know, your muscles are tight, your muscles are tight. And, and yes, they may be protective and guarded, mm -hmm. but because it's, they're trying to protect you as an organism, right. because you're, this is something that's scary. So right. 
I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, no, that's great. No, I love that. <laughs> Especially because you, I liked what you really said about the emotional component, which I think we're going to talk a little bit more about too in detail, because that's of course a huge place of, um, protection, I guess, is like you're saying, like safety for a lot of people, for women and men um, and uh, transgender for everyone, you know, that place right. is very sacred. So when we have, um, like you said, trauma or an injury to that area, it's hard for us to talk about because it's a, it's a sacred place. <laughs> it's absolutely safe and to talk about it. <laughs> absolutely. And even, you know, medical trauma, because mm -hmm. when, when folks who have penises go through the diagnostics, the traditional medical route. Mm -hmm. They are like cystoscopies mm -hmm. and other very invasive tests. They're not fun. Right. Yeah. It's not, not like a simple, like fun procedure. Like let's no. open your mouth and let's look inside. It's like a right. lot more complicated. No. And you've got, you know, lots of eyes on you and you're scared mm -hmm. and you have no answers. And it's not just often, sometimes it's not even just one time that you have to go through those tests. So, you know, just mm -hmm. acknowledging that there is a lot of part, there are a lot of parts to unpack when it comes right. to persistent pelvic pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's like you, you got, the box has a lot of pieces for sure, mm -hmm. or the puzzle does, I guess. <laughs> okay. So we talked about kind of the, some of those root causes, which it sounds like there's a lot of different variables and we'll kind of dive deeper into some of those. So are there other conditions that you see in men experiencing pelvic pain, like in conjunction, like you mentioned a little bit, but for example, like a uh, high blood pressure, like from that physical, and then some of the emotional, I'd love for us to kind of like talk a little bit more about those in detail. If you see some in uh, common conditions with patients from that physical perspective, and then from that emotional, like anxiety or stress mm -hmm. that you see then contributes a lot to the um, underlying, I would say like chronic pelvic pain from that long-term instead of the short-term. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly the psychological or the psychosocial aspects mm -hmm. to a person's experience and the interpersonal factors are going to really either help or hinder their progress. There are also some genetically predisposed um, personality traits. I like to say, again, I don't think that anyone is fixed by any means as far as like <laughs> right. who they are. And we're always changeable. <laughs> we're always right. We're bioplastic. Like mm -hmm. we are always changeable. And so, but so when I say this, take it with a grain of salt, um, right. you know, when I, when I label like personality types, like type a personality or <laughs> right. very determined, hard driven, you know, always revved up, you know, V12 <laughs> engine, you know, that sort of thing. Um, again, nothing wrong with, with, with totally being passionate and driven, et cetera. Mm -hmm. However, it, it really is, is like, well, what is driving your life? How do you live your life in general? Right. right. Is going to basically predict how you're going to respond to adversity or a challenge in your mm -hmm. life. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I do, I do think, you know, pal chronic pelvic pain syndrome, it is an enigma and that in itself is very scary for a lot of people because mm -hmm. there are no answers and there right. also isn't a single cure. Right. So as long as that is in the back of someone's mind, mm -hmm. then there's always this fear or anticipation. I'll never get better. Mm. I'll never change. It's always going to get worse. So now we're getting into some nasibic um, expectations, language, right. et cetera, which again can grow and manifest. And the larger that grows, the more difficult it is to kind of tame the beast, so to speak. So, right. And then with that, you know, can, we can assume that there's a lot of anxiety and perhaps just depression, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. So I, again, these are like mostly, you know, contributing or perpetuating factors. I can't mm -hmm. say that, you know, that is the cause of, of having pelvic pain. Mm -hmm. Um, there are some patterns, but really we, it's inconclusive at this point, as far as the literature is concerned, mm -hmm. we do know there's a high correlation with those that have had a history of unwanted sexual or emotional abuse mm -hmm. that, that in itself can predispose someone to having a chronic illness in general. Right. Um, and that has been shown for chronic pelvic pain syndrome in, in men as well. Mm -hmm. Um, let me see if there's anything else. You mentioned high blood pressure and other health comorbidities. Of course, mm -hmm. if you're generally fit and you exercise and you, you have a balanced um, nutrition and diet, you know, mm -hmm. um, that may perhaps lessen 
the risk of getting illness or, right. you know, like pelvic pain in general, mm-hmm. but again, not a guarantee because there, there are individuals that I see who are, are I would consider um, very well balanced in their health mm-hmm. and also experience pelvic, pelvic pain. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so many theories around what becomes acute, you know, from acute to chronic. Right. Uh, and that is in the neuroscience world of like, how does that happen? And a lot of the research that I've read is really about the limbic system, the mm-hmm. insular cortex, which are parts of the brain that are, are responsible for emotion, emotional learning, you know, hippocampus, your memories, mm-hmm. all of that, as far as the wiring of the brain, right. which I'm not going to get too much into because I'm not a neuroscientist, <laughs> but based on what I've understood and read mm-hmm. that, you know, there is an emotional component there's an emotional oh, learning totally. that mm-hmm. occurs with pain and that can occur as early on as in ch- as, as early on as childhood mm-hmm. um, and how we have learned about the concept of pain from our caregivers mm-hmm. and what does that mean to me as an organism so you right. know again there's a sense of embodiment of you know there's all this stuff going on we can't forget that there's this uh, sense of self and embodiment a person experiencing uh, an inner world experience like pain mm-hmm. um, that is very subjective and personal and the International Association for the Study of Pain, uh, their formal definition of pain that is that is both an emotional and sensory experience mm-hmm. to direct or potential threat to the person or their body or their tissues or their life, right? Right. And like you said, everybody has their own perception of that. Cause you know, uh, an example could be like someone that's afraid of heights. One person could be afraid of heights and one person could not. And so it could totally uh, change their whole, um, as you know, day or or aspect of the day, if they were exposed to a fearful situation. So yeah, that totally makes sense. And of course, everyone's going to have a different pain threshold as well. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Like someone Mm -hmm. could, Uh, have an affinity for piercing their genitals. Right. And Mm -hmm. that for them is very pleasurable. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Others may just the thought of that may cringe. (laughs) Right. So, you know, again, you're coming up with this, like, does pain, where does pain come from? And I really Mm -hmm. do encourage everyone to think about that. You know, where is the pain coming from really? Mm -hmm. You know, is it always in your tissues? Right. I don't think so. If you really right. look. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, that's that psychological part that you were talking about, you know, when we have um, a chronic health condition, when we focus on it more and more and more, it doesn't get better. Right. <laughs> you know, it does, it just manifests into a larger, deeper chronic issue. Right. right. And I think that's both what some, we both work with is helping people to understand that aspect in general of like, okay, you have this going on in your chronic health. What, why is it manifesting in this particular way? It's not just like from that physical perspective. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And we're not telling people that it's in their head. You know, right. Like, no, that's oh, not what I meant. All, right. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, totally. I, and I just bring that up because a lot of the people that I work with and uh, will have been told like, well, it's all in your head go see a psychologist, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Well, no, right. well, your brain, your brain, that is the major, the main CEO or the boss is right. <laughs> technically in your head, in your skull. I mean, it is an organ. It functions. Yep. It has a role. And without the brain, there would be no pain. So, right. you know, in consciousness, con- pain is a conscious experience. So, so mm-hmm. for some people, when you go to sleep, you're not, do you have pain when you go to sleep? No. Right. Or when you're <laughs> feeling sick and you're completely sleeping, like, right. are you having these, you know, symptoms? No. So again, part of some of this is like, well, your body didn't change at night. Right. And then yeah. all of a sudden it went back to like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? Like <laughs> right, that's totally. not how it works, <laughs> but there, you know, again, that's why I, I see all these things and I'm touching on, on them very lightly is because it is very complex and there's so right. many inter dependent, um, factors that are contributing to someone's experience of pain. And that's not to discount the biological, the physical, um, components of it. That's part of it. And including those psychosocial and interpersonal, um, factors as well. Yeah. Sometimes we have to fire the brain (laughs) and, you know, and, and stop the pain loop in a different way, just like not like the brain isn't 
able to be um, doing its function, but sometimes we have to break that pain loop and have a new story, a new health story, a new pain loop. Exactly. A new loop Ex- in. A new loop. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Create new experiences that are mm-hmm. positive and nourishing and empowering to override that previously driven, very familiar pattern. Right. Which sometimes we can't see when we're in it. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I've been there, Dr. Lulu. Yeah, yeah. I think, and everyone has, and everyone listening, I'm sure do. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, one thing I wanted to ask you too, which I thought would be kind of fun. Are, are there like, what are the three like top conditions that you see? Um, Cause I know you see a lot of different aspects of pelvic health and what are the top three that men are usually coming in with? So the top three conditions or complaints that men will usually come to see me with one is urinary urgency and frequency. Mm -hmm. So bladder, lower urinary tract symptoms. Mm -hmm. The second would be ejaculatory pain. Mm -hmm. Um, And the third would have to be gut related, digestive Mm -hmm. or uh, um, rectal anal pain. Mm -hmm. anything like around there. Um, and I, can I add another one in there? I guess testicular pain, (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) testicular pain. Right. And those are, I think the most common ones that people are experiencing. So that's great. Cause I, I wanted to touch base on that. Cause I know that our listeners that are tuning in are experiencing or might be experiencing Mm -hmm. or someone they know might be experiencing it. Um, and so it's nice to be able to be like, Hey, you're not alone. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And that, you know, again, that's like in the pain category, but with that, I guess with or without that, the two main um, sexual health concerns that I would, uh, that I work with is um, erectile difficulties Mm -hmm. and premature ejaculation. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, those are two huge, um, I wouldn't, I don't like to, I didn't really say the word problem, um, or issue, (laughs) just something that's going on. (laughs) I need to come up with like a new word for it. Cause I, I just don't like to label people, (laughs) you know? So anyway, if you have the, those are things that you work with (laughs) exactly. Yeah. And they're workable. They really are workable. (laughs) Yeah. Um, okay, great. And, um, I love on your website and one, this is a great thing that I love about what you do is that you have, you have all these tools and resources to help people, which I think is one just so amazing because people are looking for resources and Google is not a good resource. <laughs> it doesn't have, you know, the proper tools, <laughs> but um, can you talk a little bit about your DIY program? Cause I think it's so cool. And I'd love for people to be able to have that opportunity to go to your website and learn more about it if they need it. Thank you so much, Dr. Lulu, for that shameless plug. <laughs> yes, it's uh, the DIY, the Men's DIY Pelvic Pain Relief Program. And this program has six modules that take you from self-assessment to self-treatment. Mm-hmm. And I'm currently working with a registered dietitian nutritionist to create a seventh module specific for nutrition and pelvic pain nice. um, related symptoms in That's men. Great. So we're, we're mm-hmm. going to have a nutrition module added Yay. in there. So Wonderful for food. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, garbage in, garbage out. So I think it's such an important key factor to to just recovery and feeling well in your body. So, Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that program um, has a ton of resources. It is self paced, self guided. Um, At their videos, there's all sorts of learning modules within one module. So if somebody likes to watch videos or audio, um, you have that option. If somebody likes to read, you have that option and it really kind of, and then you have an availability to check in on your progress every week. So it's a weekly module that goes out and you can kind of check in with yourself. Like, how am I doing, you know, after (laughs) module one, how am I doing after module (laughs) two? (laughs) Did I learn anything? And you also, you're still feeling stuck. I did. I do have, you do have an op the option of scheduling a 30 minute call with me. That's part of the program. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Cause some people need that extra bit of love and attention and help. Of course. And (laughs) that's what I'm here for. It's like, here, let me, you know, feeling stuck. Let's, let's brainstorm. Let's see if we can modify some of the things that are in this program. Mm -hmm. Um, or, or challenge you in different ways because you're really excelling at the program. So yeah, yeah, it's such a jam packed, um, resource, one of its kind, honestly, that is is out there. 
That's great. Especially you, during a pandemic when you, right. <laughs> you need, you need something to do besides watching Netflix, I think. <laughs> right. Or getting yeah. access to care um, right. and for moving, a mental health specialist. Right. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> moving around and doing something I do. Yeah. And because you have exercises, um, exercises, yeah, Yeah. exercises, mindful movements, using massage balls, how to do external and internal work. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm totally a fan of motion is lotion. (laughs) All tissues need blood flow movement in space. Right. So how do we do that? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, there's a live male model in all of the videos. So it's not like, you know, you're using little plastic models, although they're very (laughs) helpful, but it's the real stuff y'all. The real stuff. (laughs) Good. Yeah. Nice. (laughs) That's great. Okay. Um, I'd love for you to give us the jewel case, like, you know, this, the star of your practice, so to speak, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy that this person was able to have help and, and look what happened to them so that uh, our listeners can like, you know, relate to something that might be going on with them. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. So let me think about a case because it's like a Rolodex in my mind. Right. <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. I'll say, okay, the, the most recent one I, I mm-hmm. had, actually, I had a case where this gentleman came in to see me for um, six days, six con- consecutive days. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was a bit of an intensive. Um, And the primary complaints were pain pain in the abdomen, pain with urination, difficulty urinating. Everything was cleared by the doctors. Um, There was a little bit of perhaps some prostate, you know, um, enlargement, Um, but the bladder also had a little bit of hypertrophy, Mm. uh, meaning that the the muscle around the bladder wall Mm -hmm. um, was thicker, but not necessarily meaning that it's stronger. It just meant that the bladder was working harder than it should. Mm -hmm. And this person tried all sorts of medications, again, Mm -hmm. this traditional medical route and nothing was really helping. Right. During our work t- together, it was amazing because we went through basic bladder, you know, bladder function, physiology. How does your bladder work? You know, if you're, what happens when you're going every 20 to 30 minutes, mm-hmm. if you go every 20 to 30 minutes, your bladder is in no way getting enough exercise as far as being able to reach its full potential for fullness. So right. you're going or relax. A, <laughs> exactly right. Or relax. So, and a hundred percent, you got it, Dr. Lulu. So a lot of what I did was education, educating Mm -hmm. this person about how their parts work, the physiology, the function, and then coming coming up with a plan of like, let's do some bladder training. Let's Mm -hmm. reassure you. How do we get relaxation in your body? Mm -hmm. There was a lot of abdominal tension Mm -hmm. and a lot of pelvic muscle tension that was just, um, there was just poor body awareness around Mm -hmm. that too. Mm -hmm. And then other accompanying, um, just predisposing factors as far as how this person led their life in general Mm. that perhaps Mm. led to this point of SOS, the body saying, no, you you keep going like this. (laughs) Yeah. I can't take it anymore. I mean, you're talking like diet and lifestyle factors that are changeable, but they can also lead to certain, just a maximum of like, I can't do this, like lack of sleep, Red Bulls, you know, that sort of thing. And and Mm -hmm. so a lot of this was just, again, education. Mm -hmm. This person was ready and willing to put and apply these strategies. And in the matter of six days, you know, no, no abdominal pain, not afraid that this is an infection because this person was told that Mm-hmm. there's constant infection in his body and it's mm-hmm. just really like misinformation misguidance mm-hmm. went from having a stream of one second start stop urination to a complete flow able wow, to relax mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. able to relax not having not having much pain or discomfort mm-hmm. um, coping well managing well just really needed the knowledge to fill in uh, to fill in those gaps and also the accountability and the support and Honestly, Dr. Lulu, this person really stressed how important it was for him to share his story. He Mm. was so excited. He's like, I know I have so much time with you. I can (laughs) really tell you what is going on for me. I have not told anybody my full story (sighs) because I never had the time. Nobody really wanted to listen. Mm -hmm. And that for me, I think is the most profound as far as what I actually did, which was just provide a safe space and permission for this person to really disclose 
all their hopes and fears, their distresses, and very intimate parts of themselves without judgment and that or rushing or rushing this person. Right. So we were really able to get all the pieces of his jigsaw puzzle and really start him off with a really solid plan. Wow. Oh, that was beautiful. You know, and I, it's just amazing when we take the time as practitioners to hear and listen and to, you know, it's just amazing when I have patients just like you do that they, they just saw someone for like five minutes, you know, that's not enough time to hear the deep sorrow that somebody can be experiencing or the deep pain and to really help them, you know, and that's what really makes a difference. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. So, so sweet. It made me like teary. <sighs> thank you, Dr. Lulu. Um, okay. Let's talk about your book because I want to make sure we have time to talk about that, which is so exciting. Okay. There's the cover for those of you who can't see it. What's the title? Cause uh, it's so fun. Oh, right. Pelvic pain, <laughs> the ultimate cock block, a no bullshit guide for men navigating through pelvic pain. Yay. So exciting. I love it. It's so cute. I love the banana on the front too. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a smashed banana for smash, those right, a smash it. banana. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. Which is okay. not fun. I mean, we're not right. making light of this situation, but right. um, no. <laughs> no, we're uh, not. <laughs> it definitely it, describes, you know, how some may feel with this issue, ongoing right. issue. Yeah. So let's talk about the inspiration behind the book, which I uh, would love to hear about. <laughs> yeah. So the inspiration, going back to even how we started this conversation, right. were the, the people that. <laughs> reach out to me, my patients that mm-hmm. had the courage and the bravery to lean into this vulnerable space and to say, Hey, I need help. And I think you can help me. Mm-hmm. And so I, I asked questions. I asked these guys yeah. questions and I said, what would you have liked? Or what do you feel mm-hmm. like you need as far as being able to help yourself or right. to get information sooner than later? Because it was not uncommon for people to reach out to me one year, two years, three years, or several years later, not having any idea that someone like me exists to mm-hmm. help with their issues. Mm-hmm. So I just thought that was ridiculous as far as like, why right. like, are we not? <laughs> yeah. Why are we not? Not it's re- not that it's ridiculous that they're reaching out to me that far right. ha- <laughs> a- along, but just more so that why isn't this information out there for men sooner? Yeah, easily why are accessible. They- <laughs> exactly. Right. What are, what is this barrier that we're coming up against? Mm-hmm. And it really was just a lack of advocacy for this patient, for this population. So I wrote my first edition, uh, you know, several years ago, and I updated for my current edition now, um, just this very past last year, 2020. <laughs> well, you had uh, a little time. <laughs> I had a little time, right? Um, and and that was my inspiration. I had a lot of fun writing this book and and mm-hmm. updating it as well because nice. there's you know as and you're you're always learning too. I know Dr. Oh, Lulu, yeah. you're totally. such a <laughs> Uh, you know, a, a sponge for, for knowledge. Right. Yeah. And- that's my brain. My brain is like a massive sponge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In exactly. a good way though. <laughs> In a good way. Right. We do this for others. We do this for right. the people that we work with because we really care and we're passionate. Yeah. And so I felt the I needed to do my due diligence because I am not <laughs> the person I was when I wrote um, the first edition several years yeah. ago. And I thought, you know, it just needs a makeover. And so nice. here we are with the updated edition. Yay. And um, yeah, it was a wonderful um, project and I'm glad to, that others now have this um, resource and, and it's accessible to anyone around the world. Yeah, which is so fabulous. That's one of the fun things about writing a book is that, you know, then people can access it all over, which I love. Um, how can men use the book to help um, heal and navigate through their pelvic pain? How is it kind of laid out? Ah, okay. So I'll be looking in this flipping around. (laughs) Right. Yeah. (laughs) Um, so the book goes through first about, you know, um, there's a story in there by a patient who's Mm -hmm. written the forward and their experience and then their experience working with me. So it gives you hope. So one of those hope stories, <laughs> hope, is <good>. right? yes. <laughs> hope is good. So we started off right off the bat with just some hope. Yeah, like hope. Your situation can change. You're not fixed. It's not permanent. Mm-hmm. Things can change. And the chapter one just lays out, well, what is pelvic pain and what isn't? And so right. I really lay it out in um, very easily digestible um <laughs> no medical jargon. I explain everything, you know, here are the ins and out, here are the statistics, et cetera. You're not alone. Right. Yeah. You're so, so friendly and and funny, which is really great for those of you that haven't gotten the book yet. You're going to love it. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. And then we have beautiful illustrations. So it's not just words, but I like to 
Oh, nice. Illustrations, Great. Illustrations, anatomical illustrations. Again, I'm such a huge advocate, huge advocate for just helping people understand how their body works, because yeah. when you understand your body and how it works, you're less afraid of when things just don't go or, right or they go south so <laughs> right, to speak right yeah totally. <laughs> no pun intended right totally. um, yeah. and physiology is so important because people don't know I'm like you don't know how your heart works you don't know why you might have a high blood pressure you don't know why you're having problems with ejaculating let's talk about it like oh, exactly you know so exactly is key and like you said knowledge is power hundred percent, a hundred percent. And then we talk a lot about the neuroscience nice. and the neurobiology behind mm -hmm. pain, as far as like, how does the brain and your nervous system play into all this? What about your immune system? Um, and then this book also is very psychologically informed. So mm -hmm. I use a lot of, you know, um, cognitive behavioral and acceptance commitment therapy type nice. like great. strategies as far yeah. as just being reflective. So this mm -hmm. book is also very reflective to start to broaden one's view from this myopic, very narrow, like mm. I'm really feeling stuck to, Hey, if I just looked up from looking at my feet all day and looked up around the world, you'd probably see a very different landscape. And so that's yeah. kind of where I'm trying to move the reader from looking at their feet and going throughout <laughs> their life, just looking at their feet to looking up and realizing that there's really more to life than, than, than this pain that's been over, so consuming. Mm -hmm. Not that it's not important, but it's right. really, it, it starts to become enmeshed with totally. your identity and mm -hmm. your whole world that it starts to consume you. And so what we want to do is start to bring the person back into the picture mm -hmm. and more of the driver of their life. Um, mm -hmm. Even if pain's going to be in the background for some time, we don't right. know. Taking control of the driver's seat. That's so yeah, key when it comes right. to pain. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. Um, and then we go to, um, again, the connections between, um, expectations as well. So letting, you know, how to, how do we let go of expectations? Um, we talk about all systems go defecation, <laughs> nice ladder, um, uh, physiology as well. So a little bit of nutrition basic, like a little bit. <laughs> how does health kind of, or nutrition kind of play into all yeah. of this? Right. Which um, is key to mm -hmm. right. Sleep and talk yeah. about sleep and how that's important and how do you do an inventory? And I give some um, helpful hints as far as like, what are some sleep guidelines Nice, great. that are recommended? Uh, we talk about things like masturbation as far mm -hmm. as tissue right. health and how does mm -hmm. a penis function and where yeah. does sex play into all this? Right. Which and a lot then, of people need information about. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Sexual health literacy is another one that's just, uh, it, we just need more of it and quality, uh, right. quality information. Yeah. Sex ed in school was not like, <laughs> <laughs> don't even get me started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The class what was, was that? Yeah, I don't know. And I was always it was abstinence. That's what right, it was. Totally. When I look back and I'm like, why were there guys in class with me? That's what I always remember. I'm like, I, you know, I mean, I think it was, it's great to have both sexes in right. a class or just what everyone, but there also should be a time where you can ask questions. And when you're, you know, 12 without having like a guy next to you. <laughs> and it was right. only one class we had, like, it was like, you know, one hour, here you go. Here's, here's your education. about You're an expert on it now. <laughs> totally. I, I hear you. I hear you. Anyway. Right. Back to your book. Yeah, back, back to, so I try to like debunk some of that, you know, right. again, these sexual, these internalized sexual health messages that we may be carrying with mm -hmm. us and, you know, just having someone just reflect on, you know, is this true for me or not? And then the second half of the book goes into the nuts and bolts of treating pelvic pain. So, mm -hmm. Um, you know, movement, uh, movement snacks. Uh, we talk about sensory integration or desensitizing sensitive tissue, vision boarding or creating mm -hmm. a vision, imagining, using imagination and visual imagery to really start to believe that you can get better and right. really kind of shift your perspective on your on your situation. Um, we talk about breathing and breath awareness and how breathing is a my one of my favorite tools for modulating pain sensitivity and mm -hmm. enhancing body awareness. And it's mindfulness or awareness, awareness practices that really help to just be aware of one's behavior, one's actions totally. and responses in response to pain or that sensation. And so how do we start to get space, um, between that sensation and our response? And mm -hmm. is it, are we really like when we respond and the actions that we're, 
we're taking in response to pain? Are they really kind of um, in line with how we see our life moving forward? You know, are they in line with our values? And so I talk about values and I talk about, well, is pain worth it to experience something more important in your life, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and list those out. So there's, you know, there's uh, movement strategies, there's those um, reflective strategies, shifting focus, using your senses, pleasure hunting, Mm -hmm. and um, lots of just, um, again, stretches and movements. And then we go into manual therapies and Great. how to use manual therapy and, and tools for, Perfect, uh, yeah. change, you know, applying some sensory input, some sensory mm-hmm. snacks yeah. into the body to change the output. Right. And I really stress the fact that it has to be safe. It has to feel good. Right. So you have to like really, um, pick and choose kind of what feels yummy. The yummier right. it feels, do more of that. You know, right. if it doesn't feel so good, <laughs> like not. not that we want to be afraid of it, but we kind of right. want to be like, what would happen if I hung out here then, you know, and just like with medications yeah. or supplements, you want to dose appropriately. So I go into exactly. that too, mm-hmm. of dosing exercise and dosing touch and um, graded exposure to things so that you're building up. So Greg Lehman is a, is a friend, colleague of mine that, mm-hmm. uh, that I look up to. And he, he's actually a chiropractor actor in in Canada but also mm-hmm. like a movement scientist and just a no <laughs> bullshit kind of person so he he would always say like we're we're calming shit down and we're building shit back up and that's really what we're doing <laughs> right in the nuts and bolts of helping totally. yourself navigate out of the enigma of pelvic pain yeah well that sounds great I know I really love the holistic aspect of it because you're you know it's when we have a health problem, especially like chronic um, pelvic pain, it's not just about that. And I think you hit it right on the the nail on the head, so to speak, you know, when you were talking about really like you have to explore way beyond the pain aspect. And I love that you give tools and actual tangible aspects and the mindfulness and breathing component is so key hundred percent. Like we need oxygen (laughs) to allow ourselves to be able to function. And, you know, that's not the only thing about mindfulness that is a key, but (laughs) breathing helps us to have more oxygen in the system, which, you know, is so important for health. (laughs) Right. A hundred percent. Your tissues crave oxygenated blood flow and circulation. And really the, one of the ways to to do that is through movement. Mm -hmm. Another way is to, again, to do some manual therapies that feel yummy, but we're really talking about communicating with your nervous system and breath and movement and manual therapy and using your senses is one of the ways that you can start to modulate or communicate with your nervous system Mm -hmm. in a safe way. Yeah. Which is so key. I love that that you talk a lot about that safety aspect and doing what feels good and doing more of that, which I think is really important when it comes to healing in general. Right. Right. (laughs) Right. Um, how can this book, um, help others to heal? Like, cause I think that's a really interesting part of your advocacy and helping others. So, um, how do you see like in the vision of people using the book that they could then use it to help others? So if I understand the question correctly as far as, um, (laughs) like the more global picture, I'll be more clear. Like, so let's say for instance, um, you have somebody that buys the book that realizes like, oh my gosh, like this totally changed my life. And then how could they use that to help others in their community? Cause I think you're talking about, you know, helping this go global. So I just want to see like your your vision. I'm just asking you like that part of it. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Okay. Thanks for clearifying. Cause I'm like, I could interpret that many different ways. (laughs) I'm not going to try to assume. (laughs) No, Yes. Yes, your global vision. (laughs) I I appreciate you for doing that. Thank you. So, um, yeah. So I honestly, if, if this book helps or just shines some some insights uh, and changes the tra- trajectory of your situation. Um, definitely just really telling other people what worked for you mm-hmm. and and what were the profound factors uh, or key takeaways from from the book. And, and I really think when it comes down to it, it's really the person taking to heart these recommendations and applying them and modifying them to their particular life. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, it's really how flexible one is with working with some of the tools and strategies and really just staying persistent and consistent with the practices, um, and giving it a really 
a good shot at it, right? right. Not just don't doing it for a week. <laughs> right. Don't give up. You have change takes time. Right. And how long have you had the condition? <laughs> exactly. And what other factors are going in, you know, have you, what else is going on in your life is going to determine that, um, that recovery timeline. Right. So just know that I, I think that's the most important factor. If I go back to your question is, you know, share, share the positive aspects of your experience, you know, share, you can also share the struggles, but we really right. need to emphasize the, the positive social support and the reassurance of you're not alone. And mm -hmm. my situation has changed. It, it may be a hundred percent. It may be 90%. It may be 75%, but really it's the emphasis on things have changed for me and that they can change for you. The other thing that people can do if this is a person who's experiencing pelvic pain is to share this resource with their healthcare providers, mm -hmm. the healthcare providers that they perhaps have saw, seen in the past who were not able to uh, provide them resources right? Yeah, um, for them great. right off the mm -hmm. bat. I think that if I had to put that first would be that is to say, yeah. Hey, you've, re you've got to, uh, got to read this book. <laughs> yes, please. And this is good for clinicians to read. I right? mean, this isn't totally. just for the patient. It could be for partners who, uh, uh, uh partners, a um, Christmas gift or Valentine's right. gift. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And any healthcare provider, because again, this, no this knowledge is not knowledge that is typically taught in the medical curriculum. Right. So if, if, if you can share this with your um, healthcare providers, or those that have helped you in the past, then that can help educate them as well. And perhaps have a resource on hand mm -hmm. for others who may be seeing them as well. And, and they can get this information sooner than later. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And you know, um, I was going to ask you too, do you have a group, uh, like a, um, where a forum where men can communicate and ask questions, anything like that? I don't, I Not don't, <laughs> uh, <laughs> like Facebook. <laughs> well, no, I, I, you know, I don't think Facebook would be the right place for something like that. Yeah. Maybe like a, um, a private group <laughs> where, you know, people would be invited in. Anyway, I was just curious if you had something like that for our listeners, if they were interested. No, I, I don't have anything like that in, in particular. I know that Carl Monahan, who is a colleague of mine out in um, the UK in London, he had he had a group, a support group for men mm -hmm. um, for pelvic pain. Um, right now, he's just doing supportive webinars. So mm -hmm. you all can check him out, Carl Monahan um, Pelvic Pain Clinic. Um, in the UK, but I, I don't have anything of that sort at the moment, but that right. is a good um, plug <laughs> or an idea for the future. Right. Maybe next, coming up next. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, great. So I have one last fun question for you today, um, Susie. If you had an unlimited budget, um, what would you do with the amount of money, whatever you need um, to make the biggest impact on the planet? Oh, if I had the unlimited budget, unlimited, well, what would you do? <laughs> oh my goodness. That's a tough question. Cause there's so much. <laughs> that's I would a, that's a to toughest do. one I'll interview, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly would invest in everyone just having some sort of mindfulness practice. I'm just speaking from my own bias because it's yeah. so has so impacted meditation and mindfulness in my life mm -hmm. has changed my whole entire world and, and it has made my mind very peaceful. So if I could give everyone this tool or opportunity to find peace in their heart and in their mind, despite whatever adversity that they're having, I would give it to them. I would say, use this tool and share <laughs> it with the world. And yeah. yeah. Oh, I, that's great. That's an easy one. <laughs> That's, for free for like free, right yeah it's an easy one yeah and it's something you, you know can just implement um and you do you talk about that in your in your book meditations I do I nice. do mindfulness right. you know it's meditation can have a bit of a stigmatized connotation to it, but, right. you know, mindfulness or awareness practice, um, it's really just about, you know, putting the snow globe down. It's like, you're shaking the snow globe and all the glitter is fluttering <laughs> all over the place. And it's just doing that nonstop until finally you're like, I'm putting this down just for a second. Right. I might not let go of it, but I'm putting it down. And then <laughs> in that process of putting it down and allowing mm -hmm. the, the, that glitter or that flutter to just come back down. I mean, it's just a peaceful stillness. It's just still. Right. And in that peace, you, you get like a sense of, um, 
wow, I have this potential to be at peace no matter what's going on, even, w- even with pain, it's there, mm-hmm. but like, I feel peace in my mind and my heart. And that potential is within all of us. And that's kind of what I'm advocating. And again, Aww. I'm biased. I love I, it. No, I love it. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's wonderful. That's I'll, I'll grant that to you. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Peacefulness for everyone. That's right. That's a good 2021. I think yeah. that's a really good place for us to all be <laughs> as at peace. Yeah. Well, thanks, Susie. It's been such a joy to have you on the show today. I learned a ton and I can't wait for our listeners to hear and experience your new book. It's good. Is it um, an audio book yet? Not yet. I'm working on it. Oh, nice. uh, it's definitely going to be an ebook that I'm just waiting for the digital files. Just 2020 has been challenging in many ways, but, <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> you know, so waiting on that. So it'll be available in an ebook version very soon and the audio as well. So, okay, great. Oh, I forgot. Let's find out. Let's talk about how people can find you. So your website, sorry, yeah. is uh, drsusieg.com. Yeah. And you have a podcast. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. <laughs> like I your do. Podcast. Yes. Talk about your podcast. <laughs> I do have a podcast. It's called in your pants. Fun. <laughs> yeah. It's a great uh, one. You guys, you gotta listen, check it out. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And that's also on YouTube. So it's on all podcast platforms and the video version of it is available on YouTube as well. Awesome. Okay. Great. Great. Thanks, Susie. Thanks again for being a guest. Thank you so much, Dr. Lulu, for having me. It was a pleasure.